Hi, I'm Ashley McElwain, licensed marriage and family therapist, and founder and CEO of Foundation Restoration. Welcome to Foundation Restoration's Real Talk podcast, where you'll find real people discussing real issues while offering real help at the intersection of clinical expertise and a biblical perspective. We're so glad you've joined us. Welcome, friends. It's so good to be together again. Welcome to the latest episode here of Real Talk. You know, recently I feel like there's just been um, a lot of pain and hurt around me that I'm seeing recently. Um, You know, obviously that's part of my job is dealing with hurt and pain and heartache and just the tough stuff of life, Um, but also just personally. I've had a lot of friends and family facing things, um, and I myself have been facing some challenging things as well. So, you know, it brought up this concept of how we can care for others well in times of hurting. Um, In episode 10, the last episode, we talked about how pain and struggle are an inevitable part of life. We can't avoid it, um, but we can use it to grow and develop in really powerful ways, Um, You know, the Bible talks about how in this world we will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world, is what Jesus said. And so we know the truth is we're going to face struggles, we're going to have pain. It's part of this broken world that we find ourselves living in. Um, But we are victors, we're not victims. And one facet of growth that I talked about in the last episode, and if you didn't take a listen, I'd encourage you to go back. Um, in some ways, it's a little bit of a introduction or a precursor to today's podcast. Um, but one facet of growth from our pain and our heartache is our ability to connect and understand and empathize with others. And so in today's podcast, I want to dive deeper into how we can help the hurting. Um, as I see it, people seem to really struggle with others' pain. In a world desperately hurting, it seems to me that we need to learn the art of caring for others. So I want to start with the foundation of caring for others. And so today we're going to dive into that topic and hopefully we can all be reminded of the importance of being present with others and caring for others and helping others And I hope that you find some of these points helpful in that journey of doing that. And um, so first point in today's podcast, it's not about you. (laughs) The most foundational and vital component of caring for others is that it's not about you. Their struggles and what they're going through is not about you. It's not about how you feel or what you need or what you even think. It's about them. And that might sound like a ridiculous thing to say, but the truth is we usually make other people's struggles about ourselves. Most of the time, we want others to be okay, so we don't have to face feeling uncomfortable or clueless or scared or awkward. We avoid our own discomforts by minimizing or dismissing others' discomfort and emotions. We want them to be okay so that we're okay or so that we don't have to shoulder or carry or deal with their burdens or how their burdens impact us. And we have to take a step back. We have to check our own feelings at the door and posture ourselves as a caregiver. There's an art to knowing when we are the patient and when we are the doctor. And we simply cannot always be the patient. So we have to sideline our own feelings to say, what does this person need from me? We kind of put on our doctor kit, our, our doctor's jacket, um, and we put off the title of patient, right? Like imagine if you went into a doctor's appointment and you sat down and you said, okay, doctor, I just want to tell you some of the things that I'm experiencing. And he's, oh, me too. No, me too. Did I tell you this morning I wasn't feeling well? Um, Yeah, actually, I kind of had some nausea. I'd like to talk to you about that. You'd be like, what? Like, no, I'm, I'm the patient. I'm here to talk about what I'm dealing with in my ailments. This isn't about you. You're supposed to be helping take care of me. And yet there are so many times in life that we are perpetual patients and we never put on that doctor hat or 
kind of have that doctor persona. We just want to be the patient. And so we really have to realize there are times that we are the patient and we're going to need somebody to step in as the doctor. And there are times that we are the doctor and we have got to care for our patients in life. When we realize it's not about us and how we feel, that's when we can finally position ourselves to start being helpful. We won't rush to a quick fix or slap a band-aid on the problem and then try to throw them back in the game. I think especially as believers, I see this a lot. It's like, here's a scripture, you know, be anxious about nothing. Okay, that should cure your anxiety. Go out there, make a difference, shine your light, be grateful. <laughs> yep, joy of the Lord's our strength. Okay. And the reality is we're usually doing that out of fear of the situation escalating beyond our ability or us feeling that it'll escalate to where we feel out of control or ill-equipped or we don't want to have to spend the time it may take to truly be effective or sometimes we just don't know what to say or do and so we panic and we just here's a scripture here's a you know what you're good you're good okay moving on (laughs) i know this probably will ruffle a few feathers but i think of this a lot with watching when kids get hurt (laughs) and again I am not trying to be critical and I know this will ruffle some feathers but most of the time what I see parents do when their kid gets hurt you're good you're good all right okay you're good you're good and I know kind of the intention behind that and I don't necessarily agree with (gasps) oh my gosh and running after our kid with every little bump or bruise but I think there's a happy medium and I'm not saying I've got this all figured out, but my approach, like when my son falls or something happens and I I know he's hurt, I say, are you okay? Are you good? And I let him do an inventory and to see, okay, am I good? Am I okay? Because I don't know if he is. I don't know. I can't assume that he's fine. Will he be fine in the grand scheme of things? Sure. But in that moment, I'm trying to teach him to be aware of his own body, of his own emotions, take inventory, and then be able to communicate if he needs something. So a lot of times I say, are you okay? And he's like, um, I did get hurt. Do you need something? And you know what? A lot of times he'll say, no, no, I'm fine. Or sometimes he'll say like, yeah and you know it'll be a hug or you know sometimes he just needs a cry he cries or sometimes he needs a band-aid but it's that sense of it's not up to me to tell you you're fine you're good it's really each person's responsibility to figure out am I good and do I need something and so that's really um with Grayson I've always tried to say are you good you okay need anything and Sometimes now I don't even need to say that. He'll be like, I'm good. I don't need anything. Um, and I, th- I think in general, that's a very basic example. But we need to have that posture of saying like, are you good? Are you okay? Rather than telling people you're fine, you're good. Because is that for them or is that for us? And that's what we, ha- we really, I think, in general have to be very sensitive to so that we can be part of the actual solution and we're not just dismissing or avoiding things. And again, sometimes there are things that just need to be like moving on. We can't belabor every little thing, but I do think sometimes we're very quick to dismiss and avoid, and I I think it's more about us than the other person and what they actually are experiencing and need. We don't have to have the answers or the fix, but we, we just need to have a willingness to care for the person, to be fully present, patient with the journey, and focused on what they are feeling and needing and experiencing. And if we are at all aware of or focused on what we're experiencing, it needs to be with the mindset of so that you can kind of compartmentalize that and set that aside to be able to then care for that other person and focus on their needs. Second point is just creating safety. Because the reality is most people don't feel safe enough to allow someone in and on their journey. You know, it, typically we, we live in, and I feel like there's a little bit of a shift, but that's a podcast for another day. We live in a culture that celebrates this toughness and independence, and I don't need any help. I'm good. I'm, I'm independent. Um, you know, and there's suck it up, move on. But the truth is that someone needs to know that you truly care for them and that they are emotionally safe with you before they can lean in to your support and care. 
If they think they're going to open up and then you're going to use that against them and weaponize it later, they're not going to open up to you. If they think that they're going to tell you, hey, I do actually need help, and you're like, oh, you know what? I changed my mind. I, I'm not up for this. Like, you're good. You're good. That undermines the overall safety of that person um, and their connection with you and their willingness to open up and be vulnerable with you. And safety comes from showing up consistently with tenderness and genuineness. And showing up may look different to different people, but most of the time we we can kind of easily discern when someone genuinely cares for us and will be able or willing to hold us. Not just physically, I mean more emotionally. And we build this safety in the day-to-day of our lives with someone, in celebrating the highs, being there in the lows, following up, showing interest, being present, prioritizing them, investing in their interests, spending time together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When we invest in our relationships, we establish safety for that person to be vulnerable and trust us in tender moments of need. Our ability then to identify when someone we love or care about is hurting through what we call attunement, just kind of being tuned in to what someone else is experiencing. We press in and we seek out how to care for them. We show them that we can handle the journey of holding their hand through the struggle they're facing. You know, it it can be offering encouragement and, and advice when they need it. Or perhaps it's silence and offering a tissue and a long hug or a shoulder for them to cry on. Or maybe it's just listening for as long as it takes. Regardless, safety comes from being able to set ourselves aside and say, I'm here for you in this, in whatever way you need. The third thing that you can do in helping somebody um, that is hurting is to ask questions and validate. Um, A big part of being able to care for someone where they're at is engaging them. So obviously in time, we learn what is helpful for someone in their times of need or struggle. Um, But it's important to ask questions. And again, this I'm thinking, you know, obviously with your spouse, you may have more insight into what they like and don't like in times of struggle, but friendships, um, coworkers, but also our spouse, because sometimes we make assumptions and we don't actually know. And, And again, this is where it's just important to ask questions. And I'm not talking about rapid fire questioning, um, where they get super overwhelmed and feel like they're in a job interview, but I'm talking about intentional, thoughtful questions that help us become students of who they are, what they're experiencing and what they actually need from you. And then validate what you're hearing and validate their experience because there's something so powerful about someone validating our feelings and validation isn't agreement it's acknowledgement it's letting someone know you don't just hear them but you understand them and again that doesn't require agreement it just requires the art of listening and caring and people tend to think acknowledging or validating someone's feelings will exacerbate the situation Like if I tell them like, yeah, this is hard, then they're just going to like go into this camp self-pity. But in fact, when we validate and acknowledge someone's feelings and um, in in an experience, we diffuse it. And so a perfect example of this is um, if you're like me, you can get kind of passionate about customer service issues. (laughs) Um, You know, you, I think about if if I've purchased something and uh, you know it's just an utter customer service failure and it didn't work and you know you try to go to the store and they don't remedy it and they kind of tell you it's your own problem and so there you are you go through the long menu to actually speak to a real live person and you know you're telling the story and it's like there's nothing we can do and you're just so angry you know at that point you're so worked up or maybe it's just me I don't know you're so worked up and like this is ridiculous how can you guys call yourselves a store like you don't even care about your customers now if that person the customer service agent on the other side of that call says this is ridiculous or you need to just move on what do you think your reaction is that is going to send you through the roof, right? Like that is not going to help the situation. You're like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. But if that person says, I am angry too. I would be angry if I were you. This is a terrible customer service situation. You're right. We didn't handle this right at all. That's so frustrating. 
What do you think on the other end you're doing if that customer service person responds in that way? There is no chance you continue to escalate. It diffuses it. Why? Because you feel heard and understood. And even if you don't get the desired outcome that you're looking for, you still feel a sense of validation and like somebody's on your side. And that makes a huge difference. So think about that. That's not something that like in the grand scheme of things doesn't totally matter, but telling somebody who's really struggling with something that they shouldn't be struggling with it, or if you tell them like you shouldn't feel that way, you are going to exacerbate and escalate that situation. But if you tell them like, I hear you, that is tough. I see what you're saying. That is going to bring the temperature down. So some sample questions um, and some validations. Um, I'm sure you can think of some yourself. But, you know, just how are you? Like, really, how are you? How are you dealing with the situation? Can you tell me what is so tough for you about this? What are you feeling? Are you needing advice and solutions? Or do you just need me to really listen? How can I support you in this struggle? Is there anything specific you need right now? Can I hold you? Obviously, only ask that question in appropriate situations. <laughs> um, but again, there's, there's a lot of power in a hug. A lot of research about that as well. Um, another question, how, how have you been dealing with this? And then some validations. You know, I can definitely see how this would be so tough for you. Anyone would struggle who is in this situation too. You're not alone. Man, there's no doubt there's a lot to this. Man, this this isn't easy at all. I mean, again, you're just kind of trying to understand and express that you understand. And that makes a really big difference for somebody who's hurting. And I'll say this as a side note, it's kind of a follow-up to the Grayson story. Um, sometimes we just see that somebody's hurting. If my kid, there's just certain times, and I'm sure you other, you know, parents out there can relate. But there are times I know my kid is hurting and I know that he is not in a good space. I don't need to ask that question because I know that he's hurt. And, you know, I would just encourage you sometimes in those moments to just hold the person. You know, I, I like to scoop Grayson up in those moments and I don't even ask him what got hurt. I don't ask him how he's hurt. I don't ask any questions. I just hold him. I rub his back. And I just pray over him. And as a simple prayer, I say, Jesus over Grayson. Jesus over Grayson. And I just reassure him, I'm here. I love you. Jesus over Grayson. Until he calms down on his own. And then he'll usually kind of in his little, <laughs> you know, you know that one, parents. Um, and, you know, he'll kind of pull back and I'll say, where'd you get hurt, babe? And then he's ready to he's ready to show me. He's ready to talk about it. I can ask the questions and figure out what he needs. But sometimes we just see somebody is hurting and we just need to hold them and pray over them and love them. Fourth point, reassure and follow up. We all struggle and hurt and we all need comfort. And that is just a fact. Um, some people are better at denying themselves of that. But we were created with emotions and we were created for a need to be comforted, to be in community. And that's just a fact. I think about 2 Corinthians 1, 4. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Psalm 25, 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Or Psalm 147, 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We have a God and a Savior who comforts us, who is there for us, who understands us, who assures us, reassures us that he is with us he cares and that he will heal us and work in our lives and be tender and comforting to us so why would we not follow that example in caring for others 
And again, I'm not saying we never have moments of, hey, we need to be tough, but I think that we have certainly over extended ourselves in be tough, move on. And and again, it comes back to, I think that we, we want it to be okay for us. And so we dis, we have a tendency to dismiss other people's feelings because we don't want to have to deal with the messiness of it. It's okay for someone to struggle. It's okay for you to struggle. It's okay for someone to need to know and hear that it's okay for them to struggle from someone who cares about them. So tell them, it's okay that you're not okay. It's okay that you're struggling, that this is tough for you. You don't have to pretend it's all okay. It's okay to give yourself time to feel you're not alone. And just that reassurance can bring such peace. Then I would encourage you to pray over them, to hug them, look them in the eyes and reassure them that you are there and care for them. Then make sure to follow up, to check in, to encourage them, ask more questions, offer more comfort depending on the struggle this can be an ongoing and tenuous task but no one should face struggles alone yes the lord is with them but how comforting it is to be the hands and feet of jesus the tangible hands and feet of jesus he didn't just go around preaching he went around ministering healing caring seeing transforming So let's follow in Jesus' footsteps and care for the hurting well with genuine love, compassion, selflessness, and care. Well, friends, this concludes this episode of the Real Talk Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad you did. Remember, you were handcrafted by God, are dearly loved, and greatly needed in this world. We look forward to seeing you back here next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Real Talk. To stay connected, follow Foundation Restoration on Instagram and Facebook at FND Restoration or visit us at www.foundationrestoration.org for more information. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to follow or subscribe and to leave us a five-star review so more people can find our show. Foundation Restoration is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry that believes marriage is the heartbeat of society and exists to equip, strengthen, and restore marriages through clinical expertise and a biblical perspective. Please consider supporting our ministry with a tax-deductible donation at www.foundationrestoration.org. Your gift makes programs like this possible. Thank you for your generosity and partnership.